Picture this, you've just arrived on your private jet to a beautiful tropical island with your significant other that you've just worked your ass off saving from a large spiky shelled turtle that breathes fire. Time for a nice relaxing vacation, right? Wrong. You're immediately met with your doppelganger who has completely vandalized the entire island in your name and you're immediately sentenced to clean it up during your entire stay there with a hybrid water gun jetpack sort of backpack thing that straps your back. Sound familiar? Welcome to Isle Delfino because today we're talking about Super Mario Sunshine for your hungover gaming retrospective. The show that takes a look back on games that dare to change up a series, or perhaps in this case, have been stranded on a console generation for many many years and have been overlooked and underrated. So without further ado, let's get started. So where do we begin? How about the Nintendo 64? I know, I know, Super Mario Sunshine is a GameCube game, but we have to set the picture here. The GameCube was only ever possible because of the trials and tribulations Nintendo went through with the Nintendo 64. The year was 1996 and console gaming was gaining some immense popularity off the heels of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Nintendo followed up their 16-bit system with a 64-bit system known as the Nintendo 64. Due to financial deals, or rather lack thereof, Sony decided that it was time for them to get into the console business as well with the PlayStation 1. And Sega? Well, Sega was chucking along with their successor to the Sega Genesis, the Sega Saturn. Video games have been in the 16-bit era for some time now, and as we gamers know, we are always looking onto the horizon, dreaming of what could come next. But no one could have predicted the trio of games to come out during that year. Through stiff competition, the video game developers were forced to bring out the third dimension of video games, and the three companies did it individually of each other, miraculously, within the same year. Three different takes on what gaming could be like in three dimensions, Crash Bandicoot on Sony's PlayStation, Nights Into Dreams on the Sega Saturn, and of course the undisputed champion, the gaming icon himself, Mario, starring on Super Mario 64 on the Nintendo 64. Here we go! Three gaming companies pushing the limits of the hardware they were working on released three drastically different takes on 3D gaming in one year. It became apparent over the course of the next couple of years that Super Mario 64 was the game to base how to control the camera in 3D space, as this is something that game developers generally never had to deal with when programming. The surprising thing is that Nintendo managed to pull off this game with a controller that didn't have a second control stick, something modern gamers that game on a console wouldn't be able to go a day without with in 2018. Fast forward to 2001, the year the GameCube released. The GameCube released in the US with 12 games, of which most were third-party games such as Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader. Nintendo also released a first-party game in Luigi's Mansion. However, noticeably missing was the company's mascot, Mario. Oddly enough, in Luigi's Mansion you are vacuuming your way through a mansion of ghosts in order to save Mario, but I digress. Needless to say, the GameCube had a decent launch, and this isn't even mentioning the launch window release of Super Smash Bros. Melee in the winter of that year. That game went on to be the best-selling GameCube game of all time, but that is another video for another time. We're here to talk about Super Mario Sunshine. In the summer of 2002, Nintendo released Super Mario Sunshine to great critical reception across the board, receiving 9s and 10s from most major gaming outlets at the time. Summertime was usually known as the drought period for game releases, but Nintendo decided to drop the sequel to one of the most influential games of all time, smack in the middle of it. The time period made sense with the theme of the game, I suppose, being that most people, dare I say it, go outside and enjoy the sunlight during the summertime at least in the Northern Hemisphere. But Nintendo wanted you to stay inside and enjoy the sunshine virtually in 2002. The game was centered on Mario's newest gadget, the Flash Liquidizer Ultra Dowsing Device, or FLUD for short. This wonderful little device was made by Professor E. Gadd, who made the Poltergeist 3000 in Luigi's Mansion, which helps Luigi save Mario from the Haunted Mansion. So it was only fitting that he give a new gadget to the other Mario brother to be fair to both of them. 
This backpack comes with two functions in the beginning of the game. The spray nozzle where Mario could spray in front of him and above him to clean services, and the hover nozzle where Mario can hover for a short period of time aiding him in platforming endeavors as the series is known for. Two other upgrades are picked up throughout the game, the rocket nozzle and the turbo nozzle, of which both give Mario new abilities to go to heights and speeds he was unable to go to before. In addition to the flood, Mario is also able to gain the aid of his dinosaur pal Yoshi for the first time in a 3D game. Yoshi is used to gain access to areas Mario was previously not able to get to, such as some warp pipes. Yoshi, being afraid of water, cannot go everywhere in the level, however so you will have to be skilled in order to get him where you want. Aside from all the fancy new gadgets, Mario has all of the jumping abilities that you have come to know over the years, such as triple jumps, spin jumps, and the like, with the added benefit of being able to slide on his stomach on water to get places faster. The game not only introduced a new gameplay mechanic, but it introduced us to some new characters. Particularly in the spotlight is Bowser Jr., who has appeared in many Mario titles since then, and has become a mainstay in the franchise. P.D. Piranha and King Boo are also introduced as enemies of Mario, and they have showed up in many Mario games as well. The game also had six different levels and 120 shine sprites, Isle Delfino's equivalent of the superstar of Mario 64, so needless to say, there was a lot of content to play. But what truly sets this game apart from other games in the series is that it follows Nintendo's trend to innovate in the sequel to a game. Historically, if we look back on the second game in the franchise, on games that Nintendo has developed, two game franchises come to mind that show a drastic change in gameplay to their predecessors, Super Mario Bros. 2 and Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. In the original Super Mario Bros. game, you had an amazing groundbreaking game in that it was a side-scroller with perfect controls and a scrolling screen. In fact, in many people's eyes, that game was the birth of side-scrollers. Super Mario Bros. 2, however, completely turned the game on its head and introduced three new playable characters, Peach, Toad, and Luigi, each of which had different abilities. Not only that, but the tried-and-true formula of jumping on enemies to defeat them went out the window in that you had to throw objects such as radishes at them in order to defeat them. And before you say it, yes, this game is essentially a reskin version of Doki Doki Panic, but which game have you actually played? I'm sure it was the Mario game, and not the latter. On the other side of things, we have the original Legend of Zelda and Zelda II The Adventure of Link. In The Legend of Zelda, you have one of the first open-world action-adventure games ever created, and this game ran on the NES of all systems. This game had a top-down perspective, however in Zelda 2 the gameplay is completely different in that it is essentially a side-scrolling platformer similar to Castlevania. Needless to say, in a world of sequels giving you more of what you've already become complacent with, Nintendo says to hell with it all, and decides to make sequels with drastically different ideas and experiences. To the untrained eye, you may think they were from completely different franchises entirely. The jump from Super Mario 64 to Super Mario Sunshine, albeit not as drastic as the jump from The Legend of Zelda to Zelda 2, is still in the same vein. And this is something I've always admired about Nintendo games. They are marching to the beat of their own drum, dancing to their own music, creating what they want to create, and without them, I wouldn't be a gamer today. But back to the point of this video, Super Mario Sunshine. This game gave us some of the most innovative platforming levels that Nintendo has ever created, and one of the worst levels I have ever played, but we won't talk about the Sandbird level. Everything was tied together by tight, immaculate control over how Mario moves, a lovely setting with pleasing presentation in a tropical island, and a wonderful score composed by Koji Kondo, who has worked on numerous Mario and Zelda titles. This game is a prime example of the Nintendo seal of approval. Like any game with tight controls and a fun gameplay loop, there will be people who try to take it to the next level as they ultimately never stop playing the game even though it was released 16 years ago. Those people are known as speedrunners. This game has fostered a surprisingly strong community of speedrunners which has come to a resurgence with the advent of streaming services such as Switch. So much so that it is pulling 200 to 500 people on a night and known speedrunners such as Nindidi or Levitin are streaming. Not bad for a 16 year old game when you have to go up against juggernauts such as Overwatch and Fortnite that consistently pull over 100,000 viewers. So with all this being said, where can you play this game? Well, unlike Mario games that came after this game and Mario games that came before it, this game is stranded on one game system, the Nintendo GameCube. 
Nintendo never ported this game to the Virtual Console on the Wii or Wii U, and who knows whether or not the Virtual Console will come to the Nintendo Switch. Super Mario 64 is both playable on the Wii and Wii U, and was remade on the Nintendo DS, so why not this game? If you do not have a Nintendo GameCube, then the best way to play Super Mario Sunshine is through emulation, particularly the Dolphin emulator. But I would never condone video game piracy, especially when there is no easy legal way to play a video game on a modern console. But who knows, maybe Nintendo will reveal the Virtual Console for the Switch, and it will have every video game that ever released on a Nintendo system tomorrow, and this whole portion of the video will be obsolete. The aim of this video and the Hungover Gaming Retrospective series is to look at games of the past that were revolutionary in progressing games as we know it. To take time out of our busy gaming schedule in order to remember games of the past, games that we may have forgotten, such as Mario Sunshine. To remember how far we've come in gaming, and perhaps to dream about how far we can go. Maybe this video will influence you to buy the game and a GameCube and play through it if you haven't already. And I'll tell you, the game certainly holds up to the Nintendo seal of approval even 16 years later. So tell us what you thought of Super Mario Sunshine in the comment section below. Was it worth playing, or does it deserve to be stranded on the Nintendo GameCube for all of eternity? And don't forget to check out all of our other content. We have a podcast every single Monday, we do Overwatch videos on Wednesdays, and we do Let's Play videos on Fridays. And tell us what video games you want us to do a hungover gaming retrospective of in the future in the comment section below. Until next time, guys, I'm Julian. Peace out.